Julie was such a wonderful mentor. To be a mentor, all I have to do is do the way Julie did. So what I've always tried to do, and I, I just sort of mimic the way that Julie would approach things. I try to encourage, basically it's like being a good parent, positive reinforcement. Uh, something goes bad, you don't say, you stupid idiot, <laughs> you just don't talk about it. Oh. If something goes good, mm. a great deal of praise, mm -hmm. and listen to whatever the student wants to do, thinks, has any good ideas. And uh, however, if I, if I have an idea that I think is better than the student's idea, I'll say it. We decide what we, what we will work on in the lab is the best idea. Mm -hmm. And if it comes from me, fine. If it comes from the student, that's even better. I'd mm -hmm. rather it should come from the student. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, so initially the usual pattern, which happened in Julie's lab, happens in my own lab. The first project a student does, it's usually my idea, because I've been around a long time and I know what's what. And gradually, as they build up s sophistication, they will develop their own ideas, and hopefully at the end of a year, at the end of two years, 90% um, of the ideas may be theirs. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of walk around the lab uh, and just see what everybody's doing and, and just brainstorm, talk back and forth, um, and uh, make suggestions. We Just a general uh, discourse and try and keep everybody uh, enthusiastic. I think we don't have enough outstanding scientists. Maybe it's not that the NIH budget is too small, though I think the opportunities are so enormous. You could double the NIH budget and the money wouldn't be wasted. But you could also argue that maybe some of the money is not spent as well and that the United States as a country could consider the model of uh, England and other places where they just say, we will, will not have major research facilities at every single university in the United States, right. but that we will focus our resources in the places that research is not something that can be done everywhere. Uh, Julie Axelrod always said 99% of the discoveries are made by 1% of the scientists. And if you sort of look at the track record of all science, it's true. And so you shouldn't have every single person on Earth yeah. have a big research lab with lots of expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. Maybe there should be a big, more of a focus. That, that, that's one approach. Uh, however, the opportunities are so astronomic with the revolutions in molecular biology that the possibilities of finding causes of diseases, cures for disease, are, are mind-boggling. And what we spend on biomedical research is infinitesimal to what we spend on an aircraft carrier. Sure. If anything works, it's surprising. Remember, as you well know, <laughs> nine out of ten things fail. Right. So anything that works is right. uh, amazing. Uh, axioms of science, I've found, is that if you have something that's actually right, if you found something and you're onto it and it's actually cr biologically correct, then all the experiments work. Everything works yeah. if it's right. right. Uh, if you find something that's sort of interesting and then it's really hard, things aren't working, then maybe it wasn't really right. Some areas that are sort of self-evident that will be important are agents that act on very various subtypes of receptors, which already are giving great selectivity. More interesting is to speculate about the future and what will happen. And it's very likely drugs influencing genetic mechanisms will be important. My own pet idea would be drugs that instead of binding to proteins should bind to promoters. Transcription factors bind to a series of bases that are promoter elements. Why shouldn't drugs? Drugs, of course, bind to transcription factors. For instance, well, steroid receptor proteins are transcription factors right. and drugs, steroids, bind to them. Right. But why can't drugs be designed that will bind to the elements within DNA. Of course, other series of nucleotides, like antisense nucleotides, uh, bind, and that's well known, mm -hmm. and they're being developed as drugs. However, there are series of bases that are not easy to develop into drugs. Uh, they're polar, rapidly metabolized, etc. Uh, why couldn't conventional drug structures bind to recognition elements in genes? And I have a feeling that if one could figure out the real challenge for the chemistry, the medicinal chemistry of drugs that would be small, simple molecules but would have specificity mm -hmm. for individual genetic elements, that would be extraordinary. Yeah.